inconvenient truths about science. There are many heavily promoted dangerous misconceptions about modern science, many of which I once shared. These misconceptions generally lead to an excessive and dangerous confidence in scientists and claims labeled as science. These can even cost you your life has happened to many arthritis sufferers who trusted scientific claims about the blockbuster painkiller Vioxx. Many other examples exist, some discussed briefly in the following video. <clears throat> I will discuss over a dozen common misconceptions. The discussion reflects my personal experience and research. I have a bachelor's degree in physics from Caltech, the California Institute of Technology, a PhD in experimental particle physics from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, worked for a successful video compression startup in the Silicon Valley, NASA, HP Labs, and Apple. Now let me discuss these misconceptions. First of all, scientists are people too. They are rarely, rarely the altruistic truth seekers depicted in fiction and popular science writing. Egos, glory, greed, narcissism, <clears throat> all of these things are prevalent in science. I want to be more clear about this. Most adults realize there must be fallibility. People have to have egos. These things have to go on. Nonetheless, in the United States, as far as I can tell, most adults compare scientists and, and see them as quite the opposite from less revered and even actively distrusted professions such as attorneys, lawyers, ambulance chasers. Scientists are seen as well. Yes, they may have flaws. There may be scandals here and there, but they are at the top level. For some people who are religious, this would be comparable to a minister, perhaps, or a priest. There are certain professions we look upon as having very high standards and pretty good people in them. That may not be deserved, but that's what we think. Most people put scientists, most adults put scientists, it seems to me, in that category. That is not true in my experience. Science and scientists today are comparable to less revered and actively distrusted, prof distrusted professions such as attorneys, particularly with respect to medicine and public health biological research with medical applications, there's a long history of truly terrible scandals and misconduct. Some notorious older examples would be the Tuskegee study of untreated syphilis in the Negro male, which was done by the U.S. Public Service, Health Service, from 1932 to 1972. It was administered by the U.S. Centers for Disease Control, the CDC, who's been very much in the news recently. <clears throat> this involved many people over a 40-year period of time deceiving a large number of African-American patients in the South that they were being given free medical service when in fact they were being not treated for syphilis even after penicillin was available to see what would happen if the disease were allowed to continue to its unpleasant and often fatal conclusion. This became a big scandal in 1972. It was institutional. Many different scientists, administrators, and people were involved in this. They published papers in scientific and medical journals in which it was obvious they were doing this. There were complaints about it prior to the scandal in 1972, the big press story, but it went on. Eugenics is a well-known but largely downplayed fad among scientists across the political spectrum up until about World War II, when it was heavily discredited by association with the Nazis, the Nuremberg trials. More recently, there are many medical scandals. The Vioxx scandal, in which several tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of patients died from a dangerous arthritis drug, which increased the risk of heart attacks and strokes. But Vax is not isolated. This is a famous quote from Marcia Engel, who was the editor-in-chief for a while of the New England Journal of Medicine, one of the most prestigious medical journals in the world. And she wrote in 2009, similar conflicts of interest and biases exist in virtually every field of medicine, 
particularly those that rely heavily on drugs or devices. It is simply no longer possible to believe much of the clinical research that is published or to rely on the judgment of trusted physicians or authoritative medical guidelines. I take no pleasure in this conclusion, which I reach slowly and reluctantly over my two decades as an editor of the New England Journal of Medicine. One can find several similar quotes from prominent editors and former editors at various medical journals, many other scientists. Science is full of ambition, greed, vanity, lots of human failings. Moral character and intelligence IQ, general intelligence, appear to be uncorrelated. Fictional accounts, and to a great degree popular science accounts like Carl Sagan and others, often seem to imply or create the impression that highly intelligent people are also in general more moral, rational, sensible. Experience shows otherwise. It's important to understand that since World War II, most modern science is funded by the government by gigantic bureaucratic funding agencies such as the National Institutes of Health, the National Science Foundation, the Department of Energy, NASA, the Department of Defense in the United States. There was a large transformation of science during and after World War II from small scale, often independent research to huge centralized government programs. That has made an enormous difference in the conduct and realities of science, created very strong pressures on scientists. This is not a new problem. It was recognized by President Eisenhower, who warned about it in his famous farewell address. Many people have heard of the military industrial complex and his warning about the power of the military and the defense, but he warned about two things, actually military industrial contra complex and what he called a scientific technological elite. This was from personal experience with the aftermath of Sputnik with attacks on his very hardline administration for not spending enough money on nuclear weapons and other activities. Attacks on him that were again based on the notion of science and the fear generated by the Sputnik event. So this is a short segment about two minutes from Eisenhower's farewell address where he speaks on the danger of the scientific technological elite. Akin to and largely responsible for the sweeping changes in our industrial military posture has been the technological revolution during recent decades. In this revolution, research has become central. It also becomes more formalized, complex, and costly. A steadily increasing share is conducted for, by, or at the direction of the federal government. Today, the solitary inventor, tinkering in his shop, has been overshadowed by task forces of scientists in laboratories and testing fields. In the same fashion, the free university, historically the fountainhead of free ideas and scientific discovery, has experienced a revolution in the conduct of research, partly because of the huge costs involved, a government contract becomes virtually a substitute for intellectual curiosity. For every old blackboard, there are now hundreds of new electronic computers. The prospect of domination of the nation's scholars by federal employment, project allocations, and the power of money is ever present and is gravely to be regarded. Yet in holding scientific research and discovery in respect, as we should, we must also be alert to the equal and opposite danger that public policy could itself become the captive of a scientific technological elite. Is Eisenhower and his contemporaries were very influenced by the enormous, spectacular success of the wartime Manhattan Project, which developed the first nuclear reactors and atomic bombs. That success, from 70 years later, appears to have been a fluke. It seemed to be an example where the government could organize a quasi-military, massive, heavily funded, staffed program with the best and the brightest, and 
make an incredible breakthrough. And there have been many attempts to reproduce that with cancer, with controlled nuclear fusion, with uh, many, many fields where it simply failed. Most new Manhattan projects, and you can find if you search with Google or other search engines for a new Manhattan project, they're being sold, promoted all the time, but they frequently, usually fail. They don't reproduce the success of the Manhattan Project. And that's something to keep in mind. This idea that if you just give scientists enough money and resources and super fund them and have a centralized military style organization, you're going to get results has failed many, many times. Yes, there's the success of the Manhattan Project. We can hope that Operation Warp Speed, the vaccines for uh, the coronavirus pandemic will succeed. But we shouldn't count on it because usually these things fail. Despite this huge government funding, there remains an illusion of independence in scientists because most are directly employed by universities such as Harvard, Stanford, Caltech, and many others. Much science is conducted by a small handful of maybe a dozen to two dozen at most big name research universities like Harvard or Caltech or the University of Illinois. But those universities depend mostly on government funding. Academics, professors will actually list how much money they've brought in in grants or contracts from the government on their resumes. That's very important. The universities are able to charge large amounts of overhead on all of these contracts and grants, which support all kinds of activities. The contracts and grants cover very frequently the summer salaries of the tenured faculty and in other benefits for the tenured faculty. Despite tenure, if you're not able to bring in contracts and grants from usually the government or some other source, your supposedly secure job is often at risk in academia. Now, you may see academics griping about uh, the government sometimes, griping about Donald Trump. That's a pretty safe target. High-profile academic dissidents, such as the linguist Noam Chomsky, usually still stay well away from truly taboo topics that are often labeled as conspiracy theories, like the Kennedy assassination, the questions about it, and there are scientific and technical questions about it, pseudoscience, or both, that is, they're labeled both conspiracy theories and pseudoscience, or sometimes denialism. So it's largely an illusion. Scientists working for universities are frequently really dependent on these government agencies like the National Institutes of Health or the Department of Energy. And bad things happen to them if they make those people angry. The federally funded academic research system is a pyramid scheme with many, many more PhDs produced than long-term faculty or staff positions. So people are recruited for very low pay, sometimes no pay, sometimes they're borrowing to do this, they're getting student loans to do this, to study science and act as apprentices or trainees or, you know, the exact status of the PhD students, the graduate students and postdocs is fuzzy. Are they students? Are they apprentices? Are they, you know, junior people who are being sort of mentored and guided? They are cheap labor, and the system produces anywhere from 5 to 20 times more PhDs in most fields, such as physics, my field, than there actually are jobs. Many of those PhD graduate students and postdocs don't realize this. There is are continual claims. There are continual claims of terrible shortages of scientists, despite this. These claims are totally false. In fact, the vast majority of people that get PhDs in scientific fields end up leaving those fields to work in other fields, especially various forms of software engineering and data analysis, which really often is like software engineering today. There's a never ending supply of young, cheap, often starry eyed workers. And this is brought about by constant government promotion of this false notion that there is a shortage when the truth is exactly the opposite. There's an oversupply. This overproduction of PhDs, this oversupply, means that there's a huge number of younger, hungry PhDs to take the jobs of the tenured faculty, the principal investigators on these government grants and contracts, the senior scientists in government labs. If they rock the boat, they could easily be replaced. 
They have well-paid jobs. They have a lot of perks. Theoretically, they have job security, but the reality is there's lots of people out there to replace them. It's very dangerous to go against whatever the funding agencies are promoting. But let's talk about some other issues. Some of the confidence in science or things labeled as science or scientists is based on the notion that these are exceptionally intelligent people. Almost mutant Superman, Einstein, Feynman. That's the idea. But experience, history, shows time and again that brilliant, well-educated, hard-working people sometimes do dumb things, both as individuals and collectively. The history of science has many examples of this. It includes many examples of collective nuttiness, particularly in medical areas, but in other areas as well. Why does this happen? We don't probably fully understand, but it includes things like egos, groupthink, some scientists take drugs like amphetamines, Adderall, to heighten their performance, to work harder and longer, to focus better. But those drugs have side effects. They cause delusions of grandeur in some people, overconfidence, arrogance. So there are many reasons for why smart people do dumb things. Pretty good chance you've probably seen some smart people, maybe yourself, do something dumb. It happens, and it happens fairly often. Cognitive biases are very much in the news the last few years with Daniel Kahneman's works, his bestseller, his presentations, and other sources. And there's a conceit among intellectuals, among highly educated people, among scientists, that if you know about these cognitive biases, like confirmation bias, you accept something that confirms your preconceived notions, or cognitive dissonance, which actually came from a kind of ridiculing study of a UFO cult, that if you know about these things, you're immune to them. They won't affect you. That's not true. There's been a lot of research in social sciences, and there's a lot of history and experience that shows that's not true. The cognitive biases, knowing about them is not enough. In fact, brilliant, well-educated, hardworking people are often better at rationalizing away obviously contradictory evidence or logic and convincing others to accept their rationalizations. Paradoxically, knowledge of cognitive biases provides an arsenal of excuses to rationalize, rationalize away the evidence or logic. You don't think about your cognitive biases. You say, aha, those people who disagree with me, those scientists who presented that evidence I don't like, that logical argument, it's clearly flawed. Here's my copy of Kahneman. It's confirmation bias. They're biased even though they are highly educated and know about all of these cognitive biases too. But they don't get it. They're losers. And I am this genius who's immune to these biases. This is a very strong built-in way that people think. It's not really new. People have known about it for a long time. The problem is that knowing about these things, and I apply this to myself as well, knowing about these things doesn't make you immune. And again, there have been many studies in social psychology that have shown it doesn't work more is required. It's not even clear what you can do to prevent the, these biases from overriding supposedly rational thought. The heavily promoted popular concept of falsifiability, and this is usually attributed to Karl Popper, who did in fact coin the notion of falsifiability and write a whole big long book about it, but he had a more nuanced view than the way it's presented popularly. And I'm talking about the popular notion of falsifiability that you would hear from a Carl Sagan or a Neil deGrasse Tyson or various popular science writers. Their version of it. That does not work in practice. Scientists can usually, not always, it's important to understand, they can't always do this, but they usually can find technically plausible, sophisticated explanations for supposedly falsifying evidence. In other words, even though it looks like it's completely invalidating their theory, they don't go, aha, it's been falsified, throw it out. You know, that's this is the way Popper envisioned science to work. Science is tentative. If you find data that disagrees with it, you rationally throw out the, the theory. That's not what happens. 
and usually scientists can explain away in various ways contrary evidence or logical arguments that seem compelling. Now, that's not always true. If, for example, the little gray guys from Zeta Reticuli landed in their flying saucers all over the world on the White House lawn, yes, the scientists who ridicule UFOs would have to say, yes, they're aliens and they're from outer space and they're these funny little gray guys. It's not unlikely they would find some way to sort of preserve their status and blame the ufologists or other people for, you know, somehow any bad things that came out of the little gray guys landing on the White House lawn. That's a humorous example. But for every case like that, there are ways to explain away otherwise obviously contradictory data. And they include cognitive biases, they include error, they include fraud and hoaxing. All of these things are trotted out, but generally within a given field, you can find other workarounds, ways to explain why something doesn't work. In the 1980s, scientists, medical researchers exposed hundreds of chimpanzees to fluids, blood that was supposed to contain HIV. They got sick. They became HIV positive. They did not die. Most of them are still alive today. They never exhibited the high mortality rates seen in human beings who appeared to be exposed to HIV and were HIV positive. You might think that would be a serious problem. Answer, chimpanzees are immune. Now, they don't say that anymore. They usually say, well, it develops differently in chimpanzees, like it doesn't kill anybody or very rarely kills anybody. It sounds a lot like saying they're immune, but they... My point is, that's just one of many examples in modern science, not 200 years ago, not Victorian era science, where obviously contradictory evidence has been explained away. And consider, how do you rule out that that's the case? HIV kills human beings, doesn't kill chimpanzees, mostly doesn't kill other primates or animals. That may be how it works. You might wonder about that a lot, but again, it's a plausible, technically sophisticated explanation. You can say, well, it evolved in chimpanzees, so they're immune, but then it jumped to human beings in Africa and blah, blah, blah. You can make up a plausible, just so story to explain obviously contrary data. And many other examples exist in recent times, in the last 40 years. Scientists have a tendency, a strong tendency, to play with the notion of uncertainty. Scientists, big name scientists, public health officials with scientific degrees often make confident statements claiming or implying no or negligible uncertainty. This is worth some explanation. There's some scientific knowledge that's pretty solid, right? We know the Earth is roughly spherical and it's about 8,000 miles in diameter. That's actually been known for thousands of years. Aristotle knew it. The ancient Greeks knew it. The Sumerians, Babylonians had figured it out. That's modern Iraq. But the, a long time ago, people had figured this out. And they had strong evidence at that time. It's very solid. Some science, some engineering is very solid. You can go to Walmart and buy products that easily work, that implement these, this technology or this science. And the accuracy with which we can predict things is very, very good. So basically, we don't have to worry about the Earth. That's some science. A lot of medical science, a lot of biology, a lot of areas, economics, things involving human beings, there's a lot of uncertainties, a lot of unknowns. We can't really be that confident. In science, there are error bars. There are estimates of that uncertainty. That's how we try to qualify things. How sure are we of something? But scientists in the modern world often take very confident statements that aren't really justified. The general public thinks of science as being very accurate, not having these error bars. It's not the way... The general public and even people with more scientific training really think about these statements. In scientific practice, if you don't quote errors, then you're basically saying you're accurate to the last digit in any numbers you give. If I say 5,382 people died in this event over here without error bars, I mean it's an exact count. That's how science works. So they make overconfident statements, which they get away with. What do you do? What do they do, though, when it turns out that statement is simply false? They can't really defend it. They get confronted about this, which does happen. They flip, and they will start to say, well, science is tentative. It's an ever-evolving process. There's new information coming in. Uh, we didn't know everything then, but now we do know everything. And there's an 80 to 90% failure rate in science, so don't, don't hold us responsible for failing. 
Um, you know, there's uncertain. You, 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 you simpleton. You hick from Appalachia. You didn't realize that science is uncertain. It's a trick. They are playing fast and loose with the uncertainties. They should have said, well, this may be true, but we have these large error bars. We're really not that certain. New information came in, the error bars got smaller. The problem is power and influence, marketing drugs or vaccines, for example, comes from making those error bars really small. People want to hear we're as certain of this thing as we are that the Earth is roughly spherical. It's 8,000 miles in diameter. We know how to navigate around the world and all that's great and it's under control. That's what people want to hear. A lot of scientific knowledge, especially recent scientific knowledge, isn't very certain at all. But if you are honest about the errors, the uncertainties, systematic things we don't know at all, what do you do? Not so easy to sell a product like Viox, for example, if you say, well, you know, we might, you know, we can't really be confident it's not going to kill you. Uh huh. That doesn't sound too good. That's why that happens. Modern scientists make heavy use of complex, error-prone, usually computerized mathematical models and advanced statistical methods that are difficult to reproduce. They are difficult to reproduce. And they're difficult to criticize because they are so complicated and they use very advanced techniques that you won't encounter, for example, in an advanced placement statistics course, which most people never take, or a college level probability or statistics course. These are often presented as if they conclusively show various claims about the coronavirus, about epidemiology. They occur with climate change, obviously. They occur in many and they become very more and more common over the last few decades as computers have become more powerful and widely available. These methods are very complex and error prone. They are prone to finding small signals that rarely exceed the normal variation of the data when small mistakes are made in the analysis. It's sometimes not even clear what is a good analysis. Some of these things are not actually that well worked out. So they are prone to making, to, it's not that hard to produce some sort of trend that may be a product of a false analysis and improper analysis, either innocently, just you made a mistake due to subconscious bias. And of course, scientists often believe they know about bias, so they're not, it's not going to affect them, but it does, or even intentionally, deliberate fraud or hoaxing. The error rate, the failure rate of top science students in school and college, universities, academic settings is very low. It may actually be 0% for some top students, those people who score perfectly on the SAT, for example, a few top students at Caltech or MIT or some of the top schools. You know, I attended Caltech, and I think there were a few students there that rarely made those types of mistakes, if ever. But, this is the gotcha, this high level of performance in a school academic setting does not translate to real-world research and development, where failure rates are clearly much higher. And I'm talking about failure rates by the best people, the top scientists and engineers. They're clearly much higher. Scientists selectively cite a failure rate of 80 to 90 percent when confronted about obvious failures. Some obvious failures that happen frequently are cost and schedule overruns that often are by factors of three over what the scientist estimated a project would take and cost. Failed cancer breakthroughs. There's a lot of medical things, product, um, projects which have been very disappointing. And if they're confronted about this, we'll get to hear about 80 to 90 percent failure rates and how tentative science is and so on. After that sort of shut down the criticism, they will go back to making very confident statements and implying that they can achieve in real world research and development error rates, almost not no error rate, that top science students can do in school. Somewhat related to this, I want to talk a little bit about prodigies and very highly successful scientists, tenured faculty, Nobel laureates, people who get their PhD when they're 18, all this kind of thing, which is often the subject of things like the Big Bang Theory or Goodwill Hunting and popular culture. Popular culture often presents these, these kind of people as genetic freaks, as mutants. They're from some poor rural family, or a, in Goodwill Hunting, the math prodigy is a janitor. He's not even, it's not even clear he's graduated high school. He's never gone. He's just cleaning, you know, the, the floors at MIT, and he's a math genius, a wizard. 
Well, that may happen, but most of these people, when you look into them or when you encounter them, they in fact often have unusual positive family backgrounds. Their parents are very wealthy, politically connected. They can afford tutors, lots of books, all kinds of special advantages. Often the parents are prominent academics. Some families go back generations of PhDs, of professors. Some families are other types of things like engineers, like owners of successful software companies or engineering companies. One of the advantages that that confers is most people from all backgrounds in the United States don't know calculus and they don't have parents who can teach them calculus. Calculus is difficult to learn and yet it's a gateway. You have to learn calculus to go forward in science and math. That may not really be necessary, but that's the way things work. That means the students who come from these backgrounds where their parents either know calculus or can hire a calculus tutor or things like that often have a big advantage. So there's a lot of reason to think, generally speaking, these are not some kind of strange genetic fluke that's occurring. The environment makes a big difference. And it's an unusual environment that most valedictorians, most that science nerd that you went to school with at your high school, the guy who graduated top in his class and went to some engineering university or Harvard or whatever, that person usually doesn't have that background. And they are at a disadvantage because of that, competing with a small number of people who do have these backgrounds. And remember, most PhDs do not become professors. Most PhDs do not stay in their field. They're young, cheap labor, and they're pushed out. The people who get to the top, the people who get the faculty positions, the principal investigators on the contracts, and the grants from the government, they're not the same. And they often have these unusual backgrounds. It's hard to know for sure because there's very limited data on this. It's anecdotal. The, the academic organizations, the universities, the government agencies, they make a big deal of producing studies about how many white people, how many men and women, how many Hispanics, how many blacks. They don't break down these numbers and performance and factors by family background, by social class, by factors like that, which might paint a very different picture. White people includes everything from very poor people, from rural areas, Appalachia, other backgrounds, inner city communities, to a special elite, which the top people often seem to come from. So that's something to think about. It's not the meritocratic picture of science that we have, that is in our society, our popular culture. Our popular culture shows middle class people from your neighborhood who go on to become scientists. And in fact, it shows janitors. It shows very poor people sometimes, you know, like with Goodwill Hunting. So I'm going to conclude with what is perhaps the most dangerous of these misconceptions, problems with science, in scare quotes, in the modern world. It's not a new thing, but it, it's out there. And that is science, big science, is promoted by leading scientists as a religion or a substitute for religion, a comprehensive, rational worldview demanding fealty and paradoxically irrational, rational obedience. There are extreme examples of this. They include, for example, the use of the term God particle or the God particle for the Higgs particle in particle physics, which is promoted was promoted by the late Nobel laureate Leon Letterman. He wrote a book with that name, The God Particle, and others. There is a long history of this merging of science and religion. It's sometimes presented as a joke. It's not really serious, but it is serious. Einstein was notorious for making a number of statements about, like, God, speaking about some sort of God, like, God doesn't play dice with the universe, is one of his famous quotes. But there were several of these quotes in various contexts back in the 20s and 30s when he was super famous, right after he became a big celebrity, a worldwide celebrity, after um, Eddington's measurements of the solar eclipse in 1919. And he was challenged about this by the famous rabbi Herbert Goldstein in the United States. He said, well, what do you really mean about God here? You're talking about God. And Einstein kind of backed up a bit and said, well, I believe in the God of Spinoza, referring to the uh, philosopher Baruch or Benedict Spinoza, 
who was Jewish. I mean, he, he was actually excommunicated by his Jewish community. He wasn't sort of an Orthodox Jewish character. And Spinoza's beliefs are very hard to pin down. The point, though, is that scientists play this game where they promote a very religious, fanatical commitment to science, as if it somehow descended from God, and God is telling you, this is settled science, this couldn't possibly be wrong, bow down before us priests of the science God, and just listen to us uncritically. They do this in concert with attacking religion for doing exactly the same thing. They are doing this, and they have a long history of doing it. Some other examples are Carl Sagan's inaccurate account of the destruction of the Library of Alexandria and the murder of the Neoplatonist philosopher and mathematician Hypatia in the original Cosmos. Uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson actually repeated this mythology in his redo of Cosmos. It's completely wrong. And like many scientific things, it fails to point out that Hypatia, yes, she was a mathematician. The Neoplatonists, who call themselves Platonists, they never used the term Neoplatonist. That's a modern term. The Platonists were mystics. They were religious. They believed in something like God. They were, and they were very close to the Christians. And Hypatia was not murdered because the Christians are like, oh my God, she's a rational intellectual. Kill her. It was a power struggle. She was friends with many Christians. Many Christians actually were appalled at what had happened. They, they, you know, the bishop of, you know, whatever, Alexandria had her murdered. At least that's what we think happened. But it was a power struggle. And she was actually very much revered by many of the Christians then and later because actually there was a lot in common between the Neoplatonists and the Christians. Many Christian scholars and uh, founders of Christianity, post-Jesus, of course, but many of these people actually had been Neoplatonists and they kept alive. That's why we have a lot of the Neoplatonist writings because they were revered by many Christians. Christianity incorporates a lot of ideas that are very similar to Neoplatonism. But these accounts create a complete fantasy world of these backward Christian guys over here and modern scientists, which didn't exist 2,000 years ago. Atheistic, materialistic, rationalist scientists, of which there's a very limited supply in ancient times. Neoplatonists, there's plenty of, but they weren't anything like that. They certainly believed the world was governed by mathematics, but they had a religious, mystical reason for thinking this. So this promotion of this science religion, some people call it scientism, is often closely tied to a militant atheism and materialism, even though it makes extensive use of religious and mystical terms and ideas at the same time, the God particle being an example. The notion of an absolute unity of everything, the grand unified field theories in particle physics, it's right out of ancient mysticism. There are many examples of this, especially organized skeptic groups like CSI or PSYCOP, Michael Shermer, and other people. Dissenting or different points of view aren't called heresy, they're called anti-science, conspiracy theories, pseudoscience, denialism, as in Holocaust denialism, and other labels. So this is maybe the most dangerous aspect of science, modern science, is this attempt to present it as this authority, this quasi-religion that isn't a religion and claims it's not a religion, but is trying to take over this obedience, this fealty to a religion. So I've discussed over a dozen major heavily promoted dangerous misconceptions about science. And I mean that as kind of quotes. It's a label. It doesn't necessarily mean what the dictionary says science means, which the original Latin meaning is just knowledge. If you find some of these misconceptions as I described them hard to accept, they don't agree with your worldview or what you've been taught, perform your own research. I have numerous articles on the false scientist shortage claims, which is also known as the SEM, STEM for science, technology, engineering, math, shortage claims on my website. I also have articles on the Manhattan Project as a fluke, which I link to, and the myth of falsifiability, which is a, a very important and widely promoted misconception. I will likely post more supporting information on the other misconceptions I've discussed in this video in the future. I want to leave you with this. Most importantly, true science requires thinking carefully and critically for yourself, not relying on authority, but thinking yourself carefully and critically, and not treating something labeled as science 
as a religion or a substitute for religion, either consciously or subconsciously. And in most cases, most people, myself included, as a younger person, this is happening subconsciously. You're not sitting there going, I'm going to the Church of Science and I'm going to worship in the cathedral. It's not conscious. In fact, they make fun of that. But it is happening, and it is consciously, I think, but certainly subconsciously promoted by many leading scientists like the late Nobel laureate Leon Letterman, the God particle. So think for yourself. Do not consciously or subconsciously let science or something labeled as science become a religion or a substitute for religion. It's not. This concludes this video presentation. If you like this video, please click like. Please click subscribe and the notification bell if you would like to receive more content from us. You can avoid internet censorship by subscribing directly to our RSS news feed. Please consider sharing the link by email and on your website or blog, in addition to liking, upvoting, or sharing on increasingly censored, advertising beholden, big company social media. We have encountered such censorship. Mathematical software is developing algorithms and software to automate data analysis, reducing the risks of costly errors, and increasing the predictive power of the results. You can support our work financially by subscribing on our Patreon page, https colon slash slash www.patreon.com slash mathsoft, or scanning the QR code in the lower right corner.